Uh, hello, everybody. So uh, what we're going to be looking at today is section 1.7 in your book, which is going to be proofs. So um, what do we want to say about this? I think, first of all, um, we will have another video where I do some more sample problems from this section, um, as well as uh, section 1.6. But I want to get this lecture out of the way uh, first. So this is going to be, you know, part one here. And there's going to be a part two. Where I do sample problems. Um, yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and get started here. So um, the basic idea here is that uh, this is what we've been leading to with all the stuff we've learned in the other sections. Okay. Um, basically, this is right. This is a math class, and what you're supposed to be doing is learning to prove theorems. That's what the math part of this class is. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, this class, discrete structures, is often a bridge between lower division mathematics, like calculus classes and stuff like that, and um, we'll say like junior and senior level math classes. Okay, so like uh, when you're a freshman, sophomore, right? So for like first two years of college, you have things like, well, what do you take? You take uh, calculus you know, one through three, uh, you have differential equations. And usually that's it. I know that we have a linear algebra class, but often that gets put into the second two years. So maybe like intro linear algebra. And then uh, your last two years, if you're a math major, that's where you actually take um, all of your, what I'll call real math classes, okay? Um, almost everything you take your last two years is a proof-based math class. So like you have like uh, real analysis, that's a proof-based math class. You'll have um, a new linear algebra class, but like a proof-based math class, you're not really gonna be focused on doing um, like, finding the inverses of matrices and things like that. You'll be proving theorems from linear algebra. Uh, also abstract algebra, uh, complex analysis. I'm just going to write anal. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have done that, but it was funny to me. So I did it. Um, complex analysis. What else? Um, every other class, right? Like. Uh, more differential equations, differential geometry. Uh, what's another math class? Uh, number theory. We're going to do a lot of number theory in this class, actually. Um, all kinds of classes, right? I can I can just keep writing classes here. Um, so you take all of these upper division math classes, and the thing that they have all in common is every one. Uh, is proving theorems. That's what you do in the class. You don't really solve very many problems as a junior or a senior as a math major. Uh, you mostly prove theorems. And um, so what this class is, discrete math, is kind of a bridge between the first two years and the second two years. And I know that you guys are mostly computer science majors, not mostly math majors. But the thing is, is that uh, in computer science, too, uh, you don't have so many classes that require proof techniques, but you have some. And it actually makes it harder for you in computer science because, like, think about it. Like, if you're going to take uh, 10 different upper division math classes as a math major, then, you know, your first one or two might, you know, be trouble for you as you get used to the way those classes work in terms of proving theorems. But, you know, after that, you kind of just like, oh, okay, so this is how a proof-based math class goes. And you just kind of, now you're used to it. Whereas in computer science class, most of your classes do not require you to prove theorems, but a couple of them do. And so kind of every time you have to do it, it's a surprise. And that makes it hard. Um, so hopefully this class will be useful whether you're a math major or a computer science major going forward. 
Okay, and like I said, um, the whole thing we were trying to do here in this class is get to this point where we could start proving theorems. Okay, so hopefully I convinced you that this is an important section to understand because um, this is what we're going to be doing going forward. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and actually get started with this now. So uh, terminology, right? We want to know what we're talking about. So we're proving theorems. So what's a theorem? So a theorem is simply a statement that can be shown to be true. So um, I'm not going to like give you too many examples of theorems right now, but like you know, every math book is full of theorems, right? Like if you say, um, you know, uh, <laughs> I was trying to think of one that was that was easy, and then there were too many that are easy, and I got confused. Uh, but like, for example, uh, if you say that if you add um, a positive number and a positive number, you get a positive number, right? That's a theorem. I mean, that's a kind of a dumb theorem, but you know, you kind of have to prove it. If you go and you take, uh, like I said, a number theory class in here, or uh, sometimes in a real analysis class as well, um, like you don't get to start with anything. You have to start with what's a definition of numbers. And once you have a definition of numbers, you have to figure out what all the properties of those numbers are. Okay, so you can't assume anything, right? Like a negative times a negative is a positive. Why? Like, why should that be true? What is multiplication anyway? So um, a theorem is just something that you're going to show is true. Okay. Now, if it's not true, it's not a theorem. So that's why it says can be shown to be true. All right. Propositions. Propositions, less important theorems. Um, a lot of times these are just, I don't know, kind of random results that you're not going to keep using over and over. Theorems you tend to use a lot. Propositions you don't use a lot. Okay, what's a proof? So a proof is what you're going to do to show that a theorem is true. So it's going to be a valid argument that establishes the truth of a theorem, right? So it needs to be a valid argument. That's why we needed to know what arguments were. Okay, and um, here's kind of uh, what stuff you use when you're developing a proof. So you have axioms. Um, axioms are what you get to start with, right? So like when you're talking about like numbers for the very, very first time, well, not for the first time, for like your hundredth time, but um, when you're going back and saying, okay, well, how do numbers work? Why do they work this way? Um, you have to start with certain basic property. Like you have to start with some assumptions. So like you might have to start with um, an axiom like there is a number one. And then you, then you can say uh, another axiom. There is a number two that is one plus one. Or something like that. Okay, so like anything that you need to assume, right? You can't prove that there is a number one. You have to start with that knowledge. So an axiom is a statement like that. It's what you're going to assume is true without proof. Okay. Now you also get to use the premises of a theorem. Now what that means is like a lot of times a theorem is going to be structured, you know, if A then B. So you assume that A is true. So that's the premise of the theorem. Um, and then also, any theorem that you've already proven, you get to use as if it was a fact, because it is a fact, right? You proved it already. So um, that's a proof. You know, the whole section is about proof, so don't worry about the details of right now. Um, okay, lemma. A lemma is a less important theorem, but specifically, helpful to prove other results, okay? So you prove a lemma because you want to prove another theorem. You don't care about the lemma, but you have to prove the lemma so you can actually prove what you care about. Uh, corollary, uh, corollary is like a little theorem that comes directly from another theorem. So like uh, a corollary is like 
the proof is trivial. Like, so the proof of a corollary is trivial. It's almost like a restatement of a theorem, but like in another form. So like, let's say you, you state a theorem a certain way and you prove it, but then it turns out that that's not the most useful way to write it. And you want to write it a different way. So you write it a different way. And then that could be a corollary, uh, or it could be like a special case or something. Um, but the point is, is that there's basically no proof to it, to a corollary. It just is directly from another proof, another theorem. Uh, okay, conjecture. So a conjecture is basically what a theorem is before you prove it. Right, you think it's true, but you did not prove it yet. Um, so math is full of conjectures. I'm not going to uh, write any down here, but um, you know anything that you know mathematicians think is true but have not proven yet is a conjecture. Um, so like, uh, what kind of stuff would be here? Well, like there's certain properties of numbers that you can verify directly, and um, what they'll do is like, like let's say you think that there's an infinite number of numbers that have a certain property. And so like you find the first one, you find the second one, you find the third one, you find the fourth one, you keep doing that, you find fifth, sixth, seventh, right? Later on, you have a computer and you make the computer verify them. And now the computer verifies that there's a hundred billion of them or something, okay? So you found a hundred billion of these things, you know, does that mean that there's infinitely many? No, it doesn't, right? If you found 100 billion, all you've proven is that there's 100 billion. On the other hand, if there's 100 billion, you probably think that there's an infinite number of them. But what if there's not? What if you found 100 billion and it turns out that there's only 100 billion in one of them, but you just stopped right before you got to the end? right? So you can't just assume that there's an infinite number because you find a lot. You know, you actually have to sit down and, and prove it. Um, okay. So enough of uh, terminology. Uh, let's talk about what methods of proof we're going to use in this section. Now, this is not the only methods of proof. There's an entire chapter on, met on a, a method of proof called proofs by induction that we're going to do, chapter five. But um, this is kind of your introductory methods of proof, okay? So let's start here, direct proof. What's a direct proof? So um, it says it right here, but let me scribble on this here. So you wanna prove P implies Q, right? So that if P, then, then Q, right? How do you do it? Well, you just assume, so step one, Assume P is true. Step two, show that Q is true. So that's really straightforward, right? If you wanna show if P is true, then Q is true, then you literally assume P is true and then show that Q is true. Um, of course, that's the most straightforward method and that's why they call it direct direct proof. Okay. Now proof by contraposition. Now a proof by contraposition is actually the same as a direct proof. Okay. And, um, something that hopefully we did, um, we at least talked about, or maybe we did one sample problem. I don't even know, but, um, P implies Q is logically equivalent. Two, not Q implies not P. Those are actually the same. And so what you do is you are going to prove the contrapositive, right? So this right here is the original, and then this one right here is the contrapositive. And sometimes the contrapositive is easier to prove than the original way that they write it. And so whenever it's easier, you just kind of do the contrapositive instead. Um, we are definitely going to see that. Um, one, I guess, a comment about this, maybe I can even write it here about this, is 
if you're supposed to do a proof with contrapositive and you don't, it's probably going to be impossible, right? Like some, there are some proofs that you need to do by contrapositive, right? Um, so uh, let's see. Look for these. What do I mean by look for these? Um, I don't know. So if you're meant to do it this way, why is my pen lagging? It makes it hard to write. So if you're meant to do this and don't, the proof will be impossible or hard. Okay, I'm gonna close the note app here. Okay, no, go away. So it'll stop lagging. Okay, good. All right, proof by contradiction. So a proof by contradiction is um, when you assume that the thing that you're trying to prove is actually not true. Um, but then you reach a contradiction, which would be like a logic, like something that can't logically happen. And so then you know that your assumption is wrong. Um, so it, it says it right there, but let me just kind of write it anyway. So like you assume, let's say P is false. Okay. So we're trying to prove that P is true, but you don't start there. You start by assuming that P is false. And then you do some math, some math. But you do some math, and then the math tells you something that can't possibly be true. Math says uh, something like, now what, what can't be true? Anything that can't be true. So like maybe say, math says something like 0 equals 1. Right, that's bad. Right, can't happen. Um, so, if you assumed that p is false, and then were able to prove that zero equals one, something went wrong. And the thing that went wrong is that your assumption that p was false is false. So then you would. Uh, oops. So then you are going to um, conclude p is true. Right? Must be wrong. Right? So I'll, I'll say that again. You make an assumption, right? So I'm going to point to this. You make an assumption. You do some math. You reach a conclusion that must be wrong. So your conclusion is wrong. But your conclusion followed directly from this assumption. So this assumption must be wrong. So if the assumption is wrong, then he must be true. Okay, so those are the hardest to wrap your head around. Um, sometimes you don't, you're not convinced you proved it, even if you proved it. Um, but there you go. All right, counterexamples. So counterexamples are not really a proof technique at all. Um, what they are is to show that a theorem is not actually a theorem. Okay, um, so if if you have a theorem that says, like theorem says, blah, always true, you find one example. where blah is false. So then you conclude that your theorem is not a theorem, right? Um, and so this one example is your counterexample. All right. 
Okay. So um, let's actually see some proofs now. So in order to do any proofs, we're going to need some kind of basic definitions that we can agree on. And the proofs in this section tend to be just kind of basic number theory proofs. And the reason they're number theory proofs is just, you know, properties of integers are stuff that everybody knows, right? You know that, or at least you can be convinced that if you add an even number to an even number, the result is an even number, like that kind of thing. Okay. So they're meant to be easy to understand so you can just concentrate on the actual proof technique that you're trying to prove. Um, okay, so here's our definition. This is a definition, not a theorem. Um, this is just what it means to be even. So an integer x is even if it can be written as x equals 2n. And then definition for odd. An integer x is odd if it can be written x equals 2n plus 1, where n is an integer. Okay, so like, for example, I mean, this is just trivial, but like, so like seven is odd because, why is seven odd? Because you can write it this way. Seven equals three times two plus one. Or actually to make it, sorry, to make it match this formula here, it'd be two, times three plus one, right? And so this right here matches the formula for odd or the definition of odd. Okay. And you know, same for even, right? So like, why is 14, why am I doing 14? That looks like it's related to seven. Um, let's say, why is um, 26 is even? because 26 equals two times an integer, all right? Um, so that's, that's all we're doing. We're just defining even and odd in this way. And then from now on, these are your definitions that you use for even and odd in this class, okay? Um, now let's, let's try to do a proof. Now, super, super important here, okay? Um, I'm going to write proofs. You should write your proofs like I do. Uh, you really should. Now, I don't write them much different than, than the textbook. Textbook is fine too. What you don't want to do is look at other textbooks or like videos online, that kind of thing. Um, you don't want to deviate too far from what we're doing because there's a lot of different ways to write proofs. People show different amounts of work, that kind of thing. Um, you don't want to not show the right amount of work. Okay, so write your proofs like me and have any trouble. So let's try this. Example one, use a direct proof to show that the sum of two even integers is even. Oh, okay, so that's what... Uh, oh, and then it's twice. Okay, oops. Um, so use direct proof to show that sum of two evens is even. How do we start a proof? So first of all, when I do a proof, I write proof. Like that. Uh, you don't really have to, but it's good to start and end your proof with something like that. So it's very self-contained. Okay, now what are we proving here? Sum of two evens is even. So we need we need these. We need two even integers, okay? So here's what you do. You simply say let x and y be even. You have to use placeholder variables x and y. You can't use numbers here. It's got to be variables. So let x and y be even, right? Now I've got my two even integers. Well, how am I going to do anything with my even integers? Well, I can't do anything with my even integers because um, I need to know what even means. But we have a definition up here, right? Even means this, x equals 2n. So x and y are even. So x and y be even. 
you could say integers. You know, you can be a little lazy and not say integers because it's understood, but, uh, you know, to be 100% um, correct, we can write it this way. Let x and y be even integers. Now, um, what does it mean to be even? Well, by definition, you could say by definition, but you don't have to. We know it. We know that this is the definition of even. So if x is even, x equals 2n for some integer n, right? That's the definition. Now, y is also even. So what is y? Well, here's what you can't do. You can't do this. You can't do y equals 2n because you already used n. And if you use n again, then you'd be saying that x and y are equal because they're both equal to 2n. So even though the definition uses an n, you have to change it based on you know what letters you've already used, that kind of stuff. So we'll use m, y equals 2m for some integer m. All right. So I've got my two even integers now, and I know what they're equal to. Now, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be looking at the sum, right? We're supposed to be adding these together, adding the two even integers. So let's add the two even integers. Um, now, I just tend to use the word so a lot. You need to keep writing uh, sentences that follow the previous sentences, and there's not too many kind of... Um, ways to connect it. So I end up saying so a lot, mostly because I'm trying to avoid saying therefore. So I'm going to, because I save therefore for the conclusion. So I say so a lot. All right. Anyway, so x equals 2n, y equals 2m. Okay. That's the end of a sentence. Uh, and then, yeah, I figured out a way to not say so. And then uh, x plus y, what's x plus y? Right, that's the sum. But what is it equal to? Well, x plus y is equal to, well, we've got x is 2n, y is 2m. So x plus y is 2n plus 2m, right? And then from there, so all of this right here, if you think about it, was something that I didn't actually have control over, right? Because I'm doing a direct proof to show that the sum of two even integers is even. So I came up with two even integers and then I added them together. I didn't even have a choice about that. That's just what I had to do for the proof. Um, now this is where I actually have to do the work. So to do the work, I need to show that this is even. How do I show that it's even? Well, even means two times something, right? That's what we came up with. So x plus y is 2n plus 2m. There's a two on both of those. So you can factor a two out right? And then technically you have to use, you have to use something that we haven't talked about, but we know is true from just what we know about numbers, right? Now n is an integer and m is an integer. So when you add two integers, what do you get? An integer, right? So we're using the fact that, um, adding two integers gives you an integer, right? So I'm writing that, that it's not technically part of the proof, but we're relying on that. Um, so hopefully somebody proved it at some point. We should have, but we didn't. So, um, all right, so how do we do this? So n plus m is another integer. What are we going to call it? I don't know, let's call it p. So n plus m is p. So 2 n plus m equals 2 p. Now what's p? Well, p must be n plus m is an integer. Right? So usually, I'm not going to be able to, I'm trying to move some text. I didn't get all of it. Okay, let's fix this. Right? 
Um, so generally it's enough to write something like this. You don't need to write the what I wrote in pink, okay? But um, this is what we're relying on, right? The fact that when you add n plus m, you do get an integer. And that's important because what we have now is x plus y is equal to 2p. Well, what's that mean? If x plus y is 2 times an integer, that means x plus y is even, right? So we can say, therefore, or I'll even explain it, since x plus y equals 2p for an integer, uh, x plus y is even, right? By definition, it's even. And then you should, when you think you've proved it, which we have now, then you should kind of restate what you were trying to prove. So the sum of two even integers is even. So then you can say like three dots, remember for therefore, therefore the sum of two even integers is even. All right, so that's a direct proof. When you're done, little square box at the end. Um, you could write QED or something like that, but little square box is what people typically do. Um, okay, let's do, here, here's an idea. Let's take this and change it to a zero, and then this will be one. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna change this to odd numbers is even. Okay, so this is gonna be pretty much the same proof, but this time we're gonna add up two odd numbers and get even, right? Like three plus five is eight, which is even. Now that's an example, that's not a proof. All right, so let's, let's prove this one. Should be easy since we did the last one. So we'll be able to do it mostly on like autopilot now. It's, it's so close to the previous proof. So you just say let x and y be odd. Now I don't have to say integers, you know, we know we're talking about integers. So x is 2n plus 1 this time, and y is 2m plus 1 for some integer n and m. So notice I kind of consolidated what I took two lines to say in the previous proof into one. You can do that, but you still have to kind of say everything. So I'm not losing anything here. I'm just writing it more concisely. So I've got two odd numbers. Once we have our two odd numbers, what do we do with them? We're gonna add them, right? So let's add them up. And then x plus y is, well, x is two in plus one and y is 2m plus 1, plus, add that up, what do we get? 2n plus 2m plus 2, right? And then all of those have a 2, since they all have a 2, you take out the 2, you'll have n plus m plus 1, and hopefully you can see that the point of this is that this right here is an integer, right? n plus n plus 1. Um, so we'll do the exact same trick we did on the previous one. We're, we'll say that's 2, and then pick a new variable, so p, uh, where integer p equals n plus n plus 1. And so I'm kind of not cheating, but like I'm explaining here, right? Like I'm making a claim that p is an integer when I say that. But um, you know, if you accept that n plus n plus one is an integer, this is not a controversial statement. So, you know, I don't expect to be challenged here, even though you know there's some justification that could be used. All right, so x plus y is 2p, so x plus y is even. So x plus y is even based on what we've done, right? Based on this. Therefore, the sum of 
two odd numbers. I should say integers, but I said numbers already, so I'm going to stick with it. The sum of two odd numbers is even. Done. All right, so that was a little more concise, but it's still basically the same proof, right? You, you didn't have to change very much. Um, all right. Let's try to do another direct proof here. How far are we? 35 minutes? Okay, we're going to be at this a while. All right, direct proof. Uh, product, so we're multiplying, two odds is odd. Okay, so let's try that. Um, again, we should be getting used to like the way we're writing these. So we're writing a proof, so we say proof. We're talking about two odd integers, so I need to make those integers up. So you say let, what are we calling them? X and Y x and y be odd integers. I'll say integers this time. What does it mean? So x is 2n plus 1 because it's odd. And y is 2m plus 1 because it's odd. Um, so where n and m integers that's just by the definition of odd uh, what are we doing this time we're multiplying them because it says product product of two odds so let's multiply them then you don't have to say and then you could say therefore or you could say so again whatever and then the product right is xy so what's xy xy is well x is 2n plus 1 and y is 2m plus 1. And we're supposed to be showing that this is odd. So what we're actually going to have to do is multiply this out. So you have to FOIL this out here. Multiply it all out. So, right, 2n, 2m. Multiply it, you get 4nm. I'm not going to write it all out. That's taking me too long to highlight and stuff. All right. So 4nm plus 2n plus 2m plus 1. Okay, that's what I get when I, I multiply all that out. Okay, so FOIL it out yourself, this is what you get. Now what you're supposed to notice is that there's a 4, a 2, and a 2. 4, 2, and 2, those are all divisible by 2. So factor out a 2. Right? Remember, even and odd numbers are always about 2. So you factor out a 2, you're going to have uh, 2nm plus n plus m, and you're only factoring out the 2 on those highlighted numbers. You still have this plus 1 at the end. So do you see how this is starting to look at the definition of odd? Look like the definition of odd? Um, hopefully. So what you're going to do is you're going to take this, and just like we did before, we're going to call that p or at least some variable name we haven't used. So 2p. But then we still have this plus 1, where integer p equals uh, 2nm plus n plus n. And again, the claim is that this must be an integer, but of course it, it has to be, right? Like we're, we're actually relying on some properties there that we're not explaining. We're relying on the fact that, like, we're relying on the fact that m plus n is an integer. We're relying on the fact that n times m is an integer. n times m times 2 is an integer. And then when you add that integer and that integer and that integer together, you get an integer. So we're actually relying on a lot of, like, properties of real numbers here, or property properties of integers, I should say. Um, but assuming all that stuff is true then i haven't made a mistake and hopefully you see here that i have got the definition of odd correct so i can say uh let's see i'll, I'll have to write this in the space that we are provided so i can say therefore what do we have uh, x times y equals uh, 2p plus 1. Um, what's that say so x, y is odd, 
And in general, what do we mean? Uh, product of two odds is odd. Okay. Uh, complete proof. Okay, so there we go. Three direct proofs, very similar. You are guaranteed going to have to uh, do some of these on the homework. Okay, let me see here. Oh yeah, yeah, this is, um, this is a, a much trickier proof here. So I'm gonna write some stuff and then I'm gonna scribble it out and you're not gonna see it in the final annotated notes here, but um, it's important that I do this. Okay, so here's our ba bad proof. So, you know, heads up, this is not gonna work. Proof. Um, M and N are integers, okay? And M N is even. So you say, let M and N be integers. You just say what it says. Let M and N be integers and M N be even. For which, so we can say let M and N be integers uh, and M N be even. Okay, so we're just assuming that that happened. Okay, now um, what happens here though is if you try to continue this proof, we're going to run into trouble. So uh, what are we going to do? We're going to have this M N is even. Now M and N are like the normal letters that we use for like saying things are odd. So this is already kind of annoying that we have to um, use a new variable. But if M N is even, right, this right here. That means mn is equal to 2p. Okay. Now what we're supposed to be doing is we're supposed to be doing do math. And the result is supposed to be m is even or n is even. How am I even going to do that, right? How am I going to get from here to here or here? I don't know. I don't know what that math looks like, okay? So I don't know how to get to the conclusion that M is even or N is even. And the reason for that is that this is a bad assumption to make. This right here, this is a bad assumption to make. I don't want m n to be even because how do I separate the m from the n? They're stuck together. So I don't know how to make a conclusion about just m or just n from what I have here. Okay, so this is a lot harder than the previous proof where we had the product of two odd numbers is odd. I knew how to do that because I could start from you know each of those being odd and then I could put them together into something bigger. I don't know how to start with something bigger and then somehow take it apart, okay? And so this is a proof where you need the contrapositive. Remember what I said? I said, if you need the contrapositive, then it's typically very difficult to do directly. You, when, you, when you need the contrapositive, you need the contrapositive, basically. So what, what am I saying? I'm saying you need the contrapositive. Um, so here's the structure of this theorem. If I'm going to skip where it says M and N are integers. So it's basically if M N even, then M even or N even, right? The contrapositive of this proof or the contrapositive of the theorem, the contrapositive is, well, look at the definition of contrapositive. I kind of wrote it right here. Um, you switch the order 
and also you negate them and that's how you get the contrapositive okay so what are we doing we're going to reverse the order and negate them so the contrapositive is if actually if not because we're negating this m even or in even then not this m in even okay so then what you have to do actually is even slightly more complicated because um if you have an if you have a not let's say p or q do you remember de morgan's law hopefully de morgan's law would say that's not p and not q right so that's de morgan's law so we need to apply de morgan's law right here which would be um m even or n even not that so that would be shouldn't say or if not m even and not n even then not m n even all right now not even is odd okay not even means odd so that would be if not m even so if m is odd and not n even n is odd then not m n even m n odd okay now this is not the proof this is just rewriting the theorem so this right here is equivalent to the theorem that I was given in example three. So that's the same theorem as M N even implies. I don't know why I use that kind of implies. M N even implies M even or in even okay so those are actually these are the exact same theorem these two same okay but what's the point the point is that this is the one that we said was hard proof but this one up here is easy to prove relatively easy to prove how easy is it to prove well, we actually already did it, right? Isn't this literally, isn't this right here literally example two? Product of two odds is odd. And then this is, this is the product of two odds, right? M is odd, N is odd. This is the product and it's odd. So it's literally example two. So I'm not gonna prove it again. Um, literally example two. So it's already done. So I'm not going to do it again. And this one, again, the whole point was that this form right here is hard. We don't know how to do it. So you wanted to use the contrapositive there. Now, luckily, your book is generally going to say, prove the theorem with contraposition or something like that. So your book will generally give you a heads up that you're supposed to be doing the contrapositive so you know to do it. Um, but it needs to be something that's just in your head and adds. If, it, if you try the proof and it's really hard and it seems like, oh, I bet it would be easier the other way around, then try the contrapositive and maybe it'll get you somewhere. Uh, okay, so we are uh, 49 minutes in. We're going to do this last proof here. And um, that will be it for today, but not it for this section. We'll do more. Uh, okay, so 
Can I cut this? It's not going to let me cut this, right? No way. Yeah, I can't edit my PDF that way. Okay, so sorry. So this example four, right, is supposed to be on its own line. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go to the last page here, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this definition of rational. So then we'll come back up. Rational numbers. So rational numbers are uh, any number that can be written as a fraction. So what does that mean? So like, uh, you know, 313 over 512. That's irrational. Uh, an irrational means you can't do that. Can't write it as a fraction. Now, I'm being lazy here. Um, any number that can be written as a fraction, um, but specifically that means an integer divided by an integer. Um, so like, for example, uh, hopefully you know that like pi, pi is irrational. Um, and you can still write pi as a fraction, right? You can say pi is pi over one, but it's still irrational because pi is not an integer. So that's not integer numbers in the numerator and the denominator. So, uh, so irrational means you can't do that. And um, so things like pi e square root three, et cetera, are all irrational. Okay, um, that's the idea. Now, the specific definition we're using in this class is uh, up here at the top of the page. So specifically, we're uh, um, the definition is specifically was it x? I'll say x. x is rational if it can be written x equals a over b, where, and there's two properties. Uh, a and b are integers. Right, we talked about that. And second property, uh, a over b is written in lowest terms. Okay, and it's actually the that second part that's important for this proof. So um, if you ever had a fraction that's not in lowest terms, then you can, you know, you can reduce the fraction, right, and make it lowest terms. So like if you say like x equals you know, 12 over um, 36, that's not in lowest terms, but you can write it in lowest terms by writing it as one third, right? Um, so it doesn't say that you did write it in lowest terms. It said if it can be written, if there's a way to write it in lowest terms, then that means it is rational. And if you can't do that, that means irrational. If uh, x is not rational, then x is irrational. That's just, again, by definition. Okay, so those are the definitions that we're actually using in order to prove our theorem, which, what is our theorem? Example four, we're proving that square root two is irrational, and we have to do it by contradiction. So the proof that I'm gonna do for you is the same proof that like every class does. If you look this up online, you're gonna find the same exact proof that I'm giving you, okay? So it's just gonna be the same proof no matter where you look. Look in the book, look on YouTube, look in another textbook, 
it's all going to be the same. Everybody's going to do the same proof. So this is okay to look up anywhere you want. All right, let's do it. So what are we doing? Proof. Right. What color? Uh, green. Proof. Uh, okay. So we don't have any like odd or even numbers to worry about on this one. We're just talking about the square root of two. So what are we doing? It says prove square root of two is irrational, right? And we're doing it by a contradiction though. So how do you do a contradiction proof? Remember a contradiction proof, you actually, whatever you're trying to show is true, you assume it's the opposite. Okay, oops. So like, if we're trying to prove that the square root of two is irrational, then we're going to start by assuming that it is rational instead. So you say, assume, oops, pen, assume square root of two is rational. Now, whenever you're doing a um, contradiction proof, you should always let the person reading it know. Right, because if you just say start a proof with assume square root of two is rational, whoever's reading it goes, "What? What are you talking about? No, it isn't." Um, right? They just think you've lost your mind. So you should tell people why you're saying it. So you should say like assume square root of two is rational, and you say like for contradiction, just to let people know that you don't actually think that the square root of two is rational. You're just making an assumption that you're going to disprove later on. Okay, so you say assume square root of 2 is rational. So what's that mean? Well, we have a definition of rational. Um, so square root of 2 equals a over b, where what do we know about the a and the b? Uh, a and b are integers. And a over b is in lowest terms. Right? That's what the definition of rational is. So we use the definition of rational, and now we have square root of 2 equals a over b. Uh, now what are we going to do? Now this is where the math comes in. Now you're not, like, you're not supposed to know this math right now. Right? What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to watch this proof, and from now on, you're going to know how this math goes. So I'm just going to tell you what we're going to do. We are going to square both sides. Square both sides. Okay, easy enough. What do we get if we square both sides? If you square the left hand side, you get 2. If you square the right hand side, you get a squared over b squared. Okay, now what are we going to do then? I'm just going to rearrange it. So I'm not doing much. I'm just basically going to move the b squared over to the left. All right, and it doesn't look like I've done much of anything, but have. I've done this. Okay, now there's actually a conclusion that you can make from this. So you see that 2, right? You see this 2 right here. Well, a squared is 2 times something. So a squared is 2 times something. That means that a squared is even, right? Hopefully you can tell that because of the proofs that we've recently done. So from this, I can just sort of conclude here, uh, a squared is even. All right now a squared is even and we actually need something that we did not prove now it's always bad to use a fact that you haven't proved um so i'm just going to state what we just assumed and you know just say hey somebody somewhere had to prove this otherwise we can't get any farther in our proof okay so here's the fact the fact is if a squared is even then a is even 
right? And the basic idea there is if A has a, like if A squared has a two in it, then A must have a two in it. But, you know, what, we didn't use this property here. Did we actually, maybe we did prove this theorem. Maybe we proved this theorem here and we didn't even know it. Actually, I think we did. I think we did. Hold on. Let's look back at example three. Maybe I'm smarter than I think. Holy crap, look at that. We we proved if M N is even, M is even or N is even. That means we actually proved this. If what about if instead of M and N, what if we used A and A? So we actually proved if A A is even, then A is even or A is even, right? If you replace the M and the N both with A's. But of course, this is A squared. So if A squared is even, A is even or A is even. So A is even. So actually we did prove this. So actually this, this step here, we proved by example three, this is true. Wow. By example three. Awesome. Okay, so A is even. Now what's that mean? If A is even, what's the definition of even? A equals two N right? We haven't used in yet, right? Have we? No, okay, we're good. A equals 2n. Now, why does a equal 2n? Because that's the definition of even, right? I'll say for integer n, and that's just the definition of even. Okay, so a is 2n. Now, what I'm going to do here is uh, at a previous line, so like this line right here, a little star there. Uh, we're going to go back to that line, and then I'm going to put in this right here. So, um, so I'm just going to put a little star here. For that star said a squared equals two uh, b squared, and then we're going to put in a equals two in. That okay. Um, so I just replaced the a with the two n. Maybe I'll say that. Okay. Um, so that's just from where we had that that star there. Okay. So what are we going to do with this? Well, let's just actually multiply out that left side. So we multiply out the left side, it says 4n squared equals 2b squared. Uh, let's divide both sides by 2. And I realize that you don't know where we're going, probably. But trust me, we're heading in the right direction. So divide both sides by 2, you get 2n squared equals b squared. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing we did for a. What does this say? So hopefully we can follow the logic. B squared equals 2n squared. So B squared is even, right? Because it's got a two in it. But if B squared is even, we know that that means B is even. And if B is even, that means B equals 2m for some m, integer m. Okay, now again, I realize that you didn't necessarily know why we were doing anything we were doing, but here's what we were doing. B is 2m, right? B is an integer, or sorry, B is even, so B is 2m. And up here, we had A is even, A is 2n. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go all the way back this first statement here. And we're going to replace a and b with what they're equal to. 
uh, going back to the beginning. You don't have to say that, but I am. So going back to the start, we had square root of two is a over b, but a is even. So a is actually two in and b is even. So b is two m and we have square root of two is equal to two in over two m. And that's actually a problem. So let's go back up here and um, look at the beginning and take five seconds to think if you can figure out what the problem is. Look at this line. Square root of two is a over b, where a and b are integers, and a over b is in lowest terms. That was the definition. You had to be able to do it in lowest terms. And we assumed we had lowest terms, but then down here, we actually get, this was supposed to be in lowest terms, but actually they both have a two. Well, if they both have a two, then it wasn't in lowest terms, was it? Right? So this line right here, it's a small thing, but it's still a thing. Um, right? Um, since A and B are both even here, A over B is not in lowest terms. Okay, so what this is, is what we call a contradiction. So you just say, um, this contradicts, so you say it, you say, specifically what the contradiction is. This contradicts the fact that A over B is in lowest terms, right? That's the contradiction. Now, what do you do after you find a contradiction? Look at the, how we do a uh, proof by contradiction. What's it say? Theorem says blah, always true. Oh no, that's, sorry, that's wrong thing. Proof by contradiction. Assume P false. Some math. Math says something like zero equals one. Specifically, what we got is math says something that was in lowest terms is not in lowest terms. What do you do? Conclude P is true, right? So literally, as soon as you find the contradiction, you just go back and say whatever you assume now the opposite. So this contradicts the fact that A over B is in lowest terms. Therefore, what was our assumption? Our assumption was right here. Assume square root two is rational. Well, that must be wrong. Therefore, square root two is irrational. And if you want more steps, I'll, I'll write it in two lines actually. So like you, the, the full logic is this, therefore our assumption that uh, square root two is rational must be wrong. And since that's wrong, then square root two must be irrational. Okay, and then that completes the proof. Now, again, I know that this is kind of like a winding road, this proof, very long for us who are not good at long proofs yet, but um, this is just the standard proof that the square root of two is irrational. Now. Why do we do square root two instead of another number? Well, like you wouldn't want to use square root three because square root three doesn't have to do with anything to do with even numbers, right? So not you can't just prove anything is irrational with this method, but it works good for square root two. So very standard proof. 
And there it is, yeah. Okay, so that was um, a long lecture. I'm gonna stop the lecture here and we'll come back and we'll do more proofs in the next lecture. Uh, good luck on your homework coming up.